Well, I'm talking about a, a, a book uh, written by um, someone else who sadly died uh, this year on the 1st of January, uh, Tony Atkinson. And um, he died after a long illness, which is relevant. Uh, um, and this book, Inequality, What Can Be Done, with uh, this um, not equal sign that Tony joked looked like the old British Rail logo, um, <laughs> Uh, has been uh, very successful, published a couple of years ago, translated into 15, 20 different languages. Uh, so it's had great success around the world. And um, Tony was um, a really remarkable uh, person. And I think a lot of people who aren't economists have rather negative views about economics or, and or economists. Um, but uh, I encourage you just to go to his website and... And, 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 and just read one of the amazing list of tributes and, and obituaries from newspapers all around the world. They're on the opening page, and I've pointed you on the, uh, the handout, which I've given out to one by uh, someone uh, Francis, called Francis Woolley in Canada, who, like me, had been a PhD student of, um, uh, of Tony's. And he was, uh, he was a really wonderful human being who saw economics very much as a um, social and moral science, so not simply a dry and unfeeling and technical um, subject. Okay, so um, inequality uh, is a subject which there's now much concern about um, around the world. Uh, it's become uh, a fashionable subject, um, as illustrated by books you see at the back. So particularly books on thinking of economists, income inequality, wealth inequality. This is now quite a fashionable subject within economics. Um, and Tony's book is say, okay, well, given we're now beginning to accept this as a subject that people should uh, be concerned about, how can we actually reduce the level of um, income inequality? Hence, the subtitle: What can be, uh, what can be done? Now, within um, much of uh, the economics profession, that um, concern about inequality is relatively new, and Tony was uh, very unusual for um, having devoted his career to the study of inequality and poverty, unusual as, uh, as an economist. Now, an important point to make, though, is he wasn't a maverick. He wasn't someone ranting in the wilderness who people didn't take uh, seriously. Quite the opposite. He was a highly respected member of the profession, knighted for his uh, services to economics, president of the Royal Economic Society, president of the European Economic Association, um, he could do high mathematical theory along with uh, the best of them, uh, always on the edge of winning the Nobel Prize uh, each year, but never, unfortunately, quite doing it. So all this reputation that he had as someone who is enormously respected in the profession actually gives uh, his book more force, because he's not just this wild man on the outside. Um, the genesis of the book, um, in part lies, I think, in his, his illness. He had uh, myeloma, and he was ratcheting down, um, and uh, he knew that the end was coming. And uh, so he decided to um, draw together his views on this subject that had been his lifetime's um, work, and uh, present them in a book that um, was less cautious uh, than most of his, the great majority of his academic writing, over um, his uh, career. And uh, so that, I think, was one stimulus. Um, the other stimulus was another book uh, written by a guy called Thomas Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century, about 600 pages long, compared to Tony's 300 pages. Um, and Thomas Piketty is a, a French economist in his uh, 40s who's now got this uh, rock star status in the profession, along with that uh, Greek guy, who I can never remember the name of, uh, the old Greek Minister of Finance, was yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So <laughs> Piketty is rather like him, and, and like the Greek guy, he goes around the world uh, promoting his work, promoting his work very successfully. This, this book, believe it or not, has sold something like two and a half million copies. Um, now, Tony's book isn't at that level uh, yet, and... Uh, Tony had been a mentor of, of, of Piketty, and I think Piketty's success in this book, which is by its name is Capital in the 21st Century, essentially about inequality, that stimulated Tony to, um, 
think, well, maybe I could write a book that uh, had more general uh, appeal um, as well. And indeed, um, the first draft uh, was simply called After Piketty, which um, uh, I commented on. I should say, um, in publicity for tonight, the only involvement I had in this book is I, I commented twice on, on, on drafts um, in, in progress. Now, um, Tony's book is a, is a substantial one, uh, not as big as um, Piketty's, and, but I encourage you to, to, if you're stimulated at all by tonight, to try and um, have a go at uh, reading it. It's now out in paperback. Um, it's uh, written, according to Tony, for the general reader interested in economics <coughs> and politics. Well, I mean, it's not quite airport non-fiction, um, but it is certainly accessible to someone with no knowledge of, uh, of economics. It's written in, um, uh, I think, an excellent style. It's laid out well. There's clear introduction, clear summaries at different points. Um, so it's not a book you get uh, easily lost in. And it's written in a very clear, jargon-free um, way. Um, there's no ranting at all. Um, there's gentle humor, irony, appreciation of literature, appreciation of history, other disciplines. Uh, so again, it's not someone sort of ranting um, in the wilderness. Now, the book's in um, three, uh, three parts, um, uh, which, of which these are the titles. Um, a diagnosis of uh, the problem, and what starts off by dealing, what do we mean by inequality, mm -hmm. and why should we care about it? Then he presents evidence on um, how much income inequality there is around the world, in rich industrialised countries, he's not concerned in this book with developing countries, and how that's changed um, over time. And uh, then he deals with the explanations for that uh, inequality on the grounds that, well, unless you can explain why inequality has risen, you're not going to do a very good job of, of making proposals for um, reducing it. The second part of the book has um, his proposals, which are on the on the handout, a few spares, I think on the table at the back if you haven't got one, uh, which he's got 15 concrete proposals for um, how, to, how to reduce um, inequality. Now, um, some of these are of the sort of classic tax and spend um, type proposals, but uh, by no means all of them, um, as I'll, I'll make clear. Um, he's very firm in emphasising that uh, simply adjusting um, tax and social security uh, is, not, uh, is not going to be sufficient. We have to deal with the, um, the inequality in incomes that are produced by the market, by the labour market and the capital market, and try and intervene in um, that uh, labour market and capital market, all those markets, labour markets and capital markets, if we're to get inequality down. Quite apart from then thinking about redistribution of the, of the um, income people gain from those uh, markets. Um, then finally, part three of the book, he, he gets in his defence, anticipating the uh, attack that he would, uh, he would receive, the objections to his proposals. Um, the first is that, oh, well, if you tax people and uh, interfere in the labour market, the capital market, uh, and spend uh, lots on social, more on social security, there'll be disincentives uh, to work, disincentives to invest, in other words, a sort of equity efficiency trade-off, uh, he deals with that, and then uh, he moves on to uh, globalisation, the idea that uh, no one country can tackle this alone, because they're powerless in the face of the forces of globalisation, and he confronts that, and thirdly, that it's uh, all too expensive, and um, he deals with that. So I'll try and give you a, um, a flavour of all of that as we go through. Okay, um, what do we uh, mean by um, inequality? Well, there's lots of concern, um, widespread concern, I think, or almost universal concern about inequality of opportunity. And you hear a lot about, well, we should be trying to level the playing field, um, give people more equal opportunities um, in life. Um, on the other hand, you can think of inequality of um, outcomes, where the amount of money you earn or the amount of um, uh, income your, your household uh, receives. Um, that's an outcome from um, the operation of uh, markets and, and governments. 
Um, now, Tony's uh, interested in inequality of outcomes, um, where outcomes, you might think, are just a function of circumstances, hence that's why we worry about inequality of opportunity, and uh, circumstances you're born with, um, uh, or come out of uh, school with, and then the effort you make given the circumstances uh, you've got. And um, that's a classic way of thinking about uh, outcomes. And Tony says, uh, well, no, we should also think about bad luck, that outcomes uh, often all sorts of random things happening in our lives, and uh, so outcomes are very much a function of circumstances, effort, and luck. And if someone has bad luck in, uh, in life, uh, despite uh, having made the best efforts, then that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about them. That, that's the source of inequality we should uh, take into account. Um, second argument he makes is that, um, uh, that when thinking about effort, it's not a, a, like um, uh, taking a music exam where, you, where, provided you're good enough, you will get a certificate. Or GCSEs, where you pass a GCSE, you reach a certain level. That so much of, uh, of what's happening in the labour market, uh, in particular, is more like a race. Uh, that only, there's only one winner, or, or, or that's the analogy, uh, a simple analogy or caricature. Take, for example, um, say the, the um, uh, professions, and think of the job of a high court judge. Well, there's only a number of slots for high court judges. Not everyone can be a high court judge. So uh, that, again, sort of emphasises our interest in who gets there and our interest in, in, in outcomes. Uh, thirdly, and, uh, and very importantly, inequality of outcomes, inequality of income, in income inequality now, uh, determines, helps determine opportunities for the next generation. That if you uh, are born into a, uh, uh, a rich or, or wealthy family, you've got much more um, chances in, in life than someone born into a uh, poor family. So um, we're uh, uh, concerned about outcomes, or we should be concerned about outcomes, as a means to trying to level the playing field for the uh, next um, generation. So even if your interest is with inequality of outcomes, you should be, uh, sorry, inequality of opportunity, you should also be interested in inequality of outcomes because that's affecting the opportunities of the next generation. Now, um, that's uh, an example of what's um, often called an instrumental reason for being interested in inequality and inequality of outcomes. In other words, you're not interested in, say, income inequality per se, you're interested in income inequality because of the influence it has on other things. So inequality of, uh, of outcomes, uh, sorry, inequality of opportunities, for example, in the next um, uh, generation. Now, um, such instrumental reasons for concern with inequality lie at the heart of um, the work of um, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, who uh, wrote their uh, well-known book, The Spirit Level, in 2009, which I, I, uh, is at the back. Um, and um, also, uh, say, Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Rock Prize winner not so long ago, his book, The Price of Inequality, also, uh, also at the back. Um, this idea that inequality is causing, uh, income inequality is causing bad things elsewhere. So in the, in the Wilkinson and Pickett uh, book, The Spirit Level, their argument is that countries with high income inequality have uh, higher crime, uh, more ill health, uh, more teenage pregnancy, uh, more obesity, and a range of other sort of social um, ills. Um, or if you want to stay just within the economics field, um, the IMF of all institutions now is concerned about income inequality because of its effect on economic growth. The argument is high inequality is bad for economic growth. Now, um, Tony is uh, not interested really in those issues in his book for two reasons. The first reason is that, like, um, I have to say, many people, 
uh, he views the evidence for those links between income inequality and all those social ills that I just mentioned, and also the economic ills of economic growth, though the, the empirical evidence is weak. Um, and uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, those of you who are familiar with their work in the spirit level, have come under a lot of sustained uh, attack for, for the evidence they uh, purport to produce. And we could talk about that if you're interested um, uh, in the discussion um, afterwards. So, he, Tony's concerned that that evidence is weak. The second but, but more important reason for him, and remember he once said to me, um, uh, imagine that uh, countries with higher inequality had lower obesity, so that by implication, maybe, if you reduced income inequality, you would increase obesity. And for him, he said, well, I wouldn't care about that, because I just think you should reduce uh, income inequality uh, per se, because he was interested in um, inequality, income inequality, for intrinsic reasons. Um, and here, this illustrated very much his view of economics as a, as a social and moral um, science, um, of which there actually is a long tradition, often forgotten in economics, going back to um, the political economists like Jeremy Bentham, late 18th century utilitarianism, the idea that the job of government was to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Um, ideas that in more recent times have been um, st still under that banner of utilitarianism have been discussed along the lines of, well, you know, a pound taken from a rich person and given to a poor person is much more useful for that poor person than it is for uh, the rich person. And uh, so if we're trying to get the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, transfers from rich to poor will help um, achieve that. And in broad terms, um, um, I guess the idea is just a very simple idea that high income inequality is morally wrong, that it's a, sort of an offence to society. And that's the sort of reasons that Tony is interested in income inequality, rather than the instrumental um, reasons. Okay, so how much um, income inequality is there? So here, here's a diagram for... Um, uh, the UK, um, and uh, I'll explain the measure there in a minute and describe how it moves over time. But the key point to, to uh, make clear is here we're dealing with all incomes received by households. So this isn't, we're not talking about wages received by employees, we're talking about incomes from all sources, labour market, capital market, social security, received by households. And what the diagram, uh, uh, I think, challenges is a, a common perception that many people have that income inequality has risen uh, everywhere in rich industrialised countries. I'll show you two or three other countries in a minute. In the last 30 years, and it's still rising. There's just this upwards, ever-increasing trend towards higher income inequality. OK, well, what have we got here? We've got a 55-year uh, uh, period, 1960 up to 2015. This is a diagram. Uh, it's not quite a diagram in Tony's book. He has a different measure, but one that gives the same um, story. Uh, but I chose this measure because it's rather simpler to explain. Um, imagine um, we ranked everybody in the UK from the uh, poorest person up to the richest person. Um, and we took out two people from that distribution, having ranked everyone from poorest to richest. The person who had 10% of people above them, so 10% of the population richer than, than them, and then the person towards the bottom who had 10% of people poorer than them. In other words, we're spanning 80% of the distribution. 10% of people still below, 10% of people still above. And we took that rich person and looked at their income and expressed it as a ratio of the poor person's income. And that's what we get here, the ratio of the 90th percentile to the 10th percentile. So the person, if we go back to the 60s and um, 70s, the person who has 10% of the population above them has uh, an income, a household income, adjusted for household size, that is about three times 
uh, the income of someone at the, towards the bottom of the distribution, who has only 10% of people below them. And that uh, uh, figure held true for some um, 25 years, 1960, up to the um, early 1980s, and then it sharply rose um, in, uh, yes, the years of Thatcher government, and then, since then, has actually wandered around at about the same level. So income inequality measured this way in the UK is not ever increasing. And indeed, if we take the more, more recent period at the end here, since the financial crash in 2008, it's even reduced. Because what's happened is wages, real wages, have I been mean, stagnant um, for uh, most people. And uh, benefits, until recently, have actually been very well supported at the bottom of the distribution. Think of the triple lock for the pensioners uh, on the national insurance um, pensions. And uh, other benefits, too, so very much supported during the years of the... Um, of the uh, of the Great Recession itself. Okay, so that immediately sort of challenges that sort of idea that inequality is just continually um, going up. Now, um, measures of inequality, of which this is a particular one that I've, um, I've chosen, um, uh, they can be quite sensitive to um, how different parts of the distribution are weighted in the calculation. And here I've, I've described a, a, um, a measure where if you take that person who's got 10% of people above them, it doesn't matter how rich those people above them are because they've got their income and you're just taking their income as a ratio to the person near the bottom. And it doesn't matter how poor those people are below them. So you're just looking at two points in the distribution, that one compared to that one. So in particular, it's not going to pick up the very rich, because the very rich aren't influencing this calculation at all. They're above the key point, that 90th uh, percentile. Now, so let's turn to another country and look at a different uh, measure. Here's um, a diagram uh, taken from um, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty's work, not from this book, but a more recent um, paper, and it's uh, not a very good reproduction, but... Um, it's uh, really quite an interesting diagram. This shows a different measure, the share of total income received by the top 1%. So you go right to the top of the distribution, the very top 1%, the richest 1%. What share of total income do they have? And this diagram goes uh, over 100 years, from 1900 onwards. And um, in that uh, pre um, Second World War period in the three countries illustrated here, the United States, Japan and France, the, the top 1% were, were getting here, we see somewhere between 15 and 20% of um, total income. Top 1% getting about 20% of total income. And then this figure collapsed as a result of all the upheavals of uh, the Second World War. And then, in, the, in all three countries, stayed round about 10% uh, or a bit below. And then we can see in the US, which is the yellow line, it's since uh, the late 1970s, it's marched up and up and up. So the share of the top 1% in the US is now back up to the level that um, prevailed in the um, 20s and 30s. So there's a case. And that top income, uh, sh that share of the 1% is indeed just continually, it seems, going up over the last uh, 30 years. Whereas in Japan and France, it hasn't. It's stayed um, very um, stable. Now, again, we can go into the reasons for that um, uh, later if we like. But the point here is to, to illustrate that uh, we do, well, two points to illustrate. One, we have to be careful about what measure of inequality we take, and the, 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 there's been a great deal of interest in, in recent years about this top 1%. I think you've seen the Danny Dawling uh, book at the uh, back called something 1%, uh, which is picking up on this, um, this, uh, this sort of research. 
Um, and secondly, it shows that uh, different countries have had different trajectories. There's not some universal rule that's ever uh, that's pushing up inequality across um, all countries. Now, if the UK was on here, if the UK was on here, it would be a, uh, it would follow this same pattern, and then would come up there, broadly speaking, between the two. So the US is an extreme example, but the UK is another example where the share of top 1% has uh, gone up substantially, hidden in that previous diagram by the calculation I showed in that previous diagram. But um, in other countries, we don't see it, and uh, so there's considerable variation across um, rich industrial countries in the profile of uh, inequality over time. However, and I haven't shown you a summary diagram to, to, to demonstrate this point, it is broadly true that whether it's come in sort of step jumps like that in the UK, or whether it's come with this different measure like that in the US with a sort of steady progression upwards, most industrialised countries have seen some substantial rises in inequality over the last 30 years, but not, but not all, and often in, in ways that differ across, uh, across time. Okay, um, what are the explanations for um, rises in, in inequality? Well, the standard explanation that um, is, is, is offered by economists is some, goes under this um, uh, unfortunate phrase, skilled bias technological change. But it's actually quite an easy thing to, to understand. The idea is technological change, e.g. computers, has driven up the demand for skills and uh, skilled workers, and that the supply of skilled workers hasn't risen as fast as the demand for skilled workers. So, that means the wages for skilled workers have gone up, and likewise the wages for skilled, unskilled workers have gone down. In other words, there's been a, a, a widening out of the, of the earnings distribution. Um, and the argument is also that that is compounded by globalisation, as rich industrialised countries have outsourced the um, low-skill uh, uh, work to, to lower-wage countries. Now, that's a sort of heroic simplification of the, the, the explanation economists offer for rising um, income inequality. And you, you'll note that that's an argument about, it's an, really an argument about wages, of individuals. It's not an argument about total incomes of, uh, of households. Now, but we can use that argument to think about total incomes of households, um, partly drawing on uh, another jargon, coming this time from sociology, uh, an observation that um, people of different, uh, people of similar types tend to marry, live together, what the sociologists would call assortative mating. So people with higher skills tend to, on average, live in households with people with higher skills. So in other words, this story about individual wage inequality is reinforced when you think about total household incomes of, of, of people living um, together. However, um, and here we're going to get to Tony's proposals, um, technical change in part, which has been driving this, in part rises from decisions that are made by governments and um, firms and entrepreneurs. It's not just a completely exogenous thing that's just external factor that's uh, hitting economies. It's technical change takes place because people have worked at and invested in technical change. And some of you